What's up, everybody? Welcome back to another episode of Blood on the Razor Wire TV. Today, we got a guest on that was at USP Lee. Some of you dudes that are watching, you think, oh, man, I'm only going to get a little bit of time. I won't end up in the USP. But I'll tell you what, his story might change your thought process. But anyway, Keith, tell the people who you are, tell them where you're from, and let's talk a little bit about you and your life. Uh, my name is Keith Pickens, and I'm from Virginia, the eastern Virginia area around Norfolk. Uh, I grew up in the country and got into drugs and street lights, you know, so I, I went to the city and got caught up in the fast life, and it was a little faster than than I was prepared for, I guess. And uh, probably not not your typical uh, federal story because I wasn't, you know, I wasn't really getting no money. Uh, we were, it was just a group of us, just dope fiends, full time, you know, all day, every day was spent uh, stealing stuff or hustling people to get money, to go get drugs, to go get more money, to go get more drugs. and. Um, I used to build towers, cell phone towers, TV towers, and whatnot. So eventually, we started stealing some of the grounding systems off of them. The the copper, copper was high. Uh, I had all the gate combinations all over the country, you know. So we just we went stealing like it was a full time job. And eventually, the FBI had set up this this task force hunting us. You know, we were the, the copper bandits. That's my 15 minutes of fame. Uh, but unbeknownst to us, you know, we thought we were just small time petty criminals stealing a little copper, uh, which turned out all together to be a whole lot of copper. And, uh, you know, it's all fun and games until the FBI shows up. And uh, so I got caught, the, the narcotic squad in Norfolk caught me just scoring dope, just on a fluke. On uh, Friday the 13th, they just rode by and a group of white folks in a car, you know, that's what they told me. I was like, well, you know, why would you stop us? And they said, well, three white people sitting back here at church is chicken. You didn't look like you were waiting on no chicken. And uh, I'm like, well, that's kind of messed up, ain't it? And he said, it is what it is, buddy. And, <laughs> you know, uh, that that was a wrap, you know. Let's talk about your addiction, right? Because, you know, you mentioned that first. We'll get into the prison stuff in a minute, but your addiction, right? What was your family life like growing up? I want to know that first. It was it was good um, for the most part. But I got really abused as a, as a very small child by somebody that was brought into the family. You know, like he was a foster kid of, of one of my relatives. And... I think that that set the the course of my life in a lot of ways, because uh, it was happening before I could remember. You know what I mean? Like it just always was. So that messed stuff up a whole lot. But I mean, as far as my my parents and and how I was raised and all that, it was good. We we grew up in the country, the type of childhood, other than the the crazy rape of part. Uh, it's a, the type of childhood I, I would I wish more kids could have now, you know, playing outside and plenty of land and it both parents were there, but my dad was gone a whole lot. He drove a truck long distance. So he wasn't there a whole lot. But but I mean everything was pretty pretty good. I have uh two sisters and a brother and we got along pretty well. My older sister, she's a good bit older than the rest of us. Um, she actually did real good in life. She did the right thing. She was square. And the other three of us were knuckleheads. But I was the oldest. I feel like a lot of that, a lot of the the wreckage of their life also came uh, from that pervert. You know, and it took me a long time to come to terms with, with that and get past it. Um, but I think finally realizing like after going through prison and realizing that he was actually still a kid too, and he was messed up. Somebody messed him up and it set his, his life on that course. And that doesn't excuse it, but you know, cause a whole lot of the stuff I was doing 
stealing and, and lying and swindling. That didn't line up with what I knew was right, you know, but but somehow it was just a compulsive thing where it was almost like I wasn't even doing it. I was in the passenger seat of a vehicle and we were on that ride, you know? So when uh when God woke me up to that, like you're not just just uh compelled to to follow the those say you have a choice, you know what I mean? All of us have a choice every day of how we're going to act. Um, I don't know. I just, I got rid of a lot of the anger and it, that freed me, I think, to to kind of finally stay away from drugs. You know, I got years clean now other than weed. I smoke weed, but like I don't even take psychiatric medication anymore because of cannabis. And obviously, you know, with hearing that story, I've been on all kinds of psych meds my whole life, you know talk about that addiction right you were getting high i mean what were you doing shooting dope back then yeah how did that start how does that start for 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 a young country boy like yourself um well i thought i was going to be in law enforcement at one time actually it's crazy as that that sounds and uh my first wife was kind of like a stoner and i decided to forego that and I got into building towers and I was making good money and you know it's a it's a wild group of dudes that work way up in the air you know you work hard and it's dangerous and you party hard and one day and I'd never even smoked no weed as a kid growing up I was just a drunk you know from the time I was a little kid I drank a lot and uh this dude had had some coke and a little bit of powder and he broke it out and I'd never even seen it before. I was about 23, 24 years old. And uh, he was like, you know, if I do this by myself, man, I'm not going to be able to sleep tonight. All this. And he was trying to talk me into it. And my ex-wife joined in and she kind of thought that I was up too uptight. You know, I just took everything too serious and I should, I should experiment. And we went back and forth and eventually I caved into the peer pressure. And uh, I did two lines of powder, and it was like somebody flipped the switch. You know, uh, a few days later, I bought some, and then pretty soon, I was never not with it. And it didn't affect my work life in a in a negative way for a good long while. Like, I was grinding, you know, and pretty soon, I had my own crew with a truck, and I'm just sniffing powder constantly all the time. Not doing a lot, just little bumps throughout the day. But, you know, I'm, I'm running them boys in the ground. Uh, we'd work all day and drive all night and keep going, you know. And uh, eventually it did catch up to me at work. And I, I lost that job. Well, I quit. We, I got into it with them. But it was because of the drug use. And, um, I started – by then I was pretty immersed in the, in the culture of partying. And somebody had some, what they call diesel. I didn't have no real, I think I knew on some level that it was heroin, but it was just D. People called it dope. They called it diesel. It come in little stamp bags. and White people really couldn't get it in the little town where I was at. You know, it was like a very divided town. But me and, and my group of friends was in both worlds. You know, I had a lot of, a lot of black friends and and that's just how we grew up you know uh it it wasn't until i got to a usb that i started seeing that you know how people act with segregation type stuff but uh so i had a a window into another world that a lot of the people that i that i knew out in the country because of this little town i'm in now i i have access to dope and i started sniffing heroin immediately started selling it then i started going to norfolk to get it you know we'd go down there and you could get a bundle for 80 dollars, and i'd take each one of them you know bundles 10 10 dime pills i'd take each one of them and make three 15 bags out of it in franklin in the town i was at uh, so then i got into getting the money with it and it was it was supporting my use 
I wasn't working. And, you know, things go. A year or two goes by. And pretty soon I start trying to shoot up. Uh, that destroyed the, the business of being a pharmaceutical entrepreneur uh, because now I couldn't have no drugs. I was just constantly doing them. So we started, you know, we just conning people, taking money. We we did all kind of any any dirtbag thing you could imagine, including snatching purses. You know, we just we just did it. And eventually, I got I got proficient at shoplifting, boosting. We would steal out of stores, and that's what I went to prison for the first time. First time I got caught, first offense. I was pushing a shopping cart full of stuff out of uh, Walmart. The guy didn't, he wasn't even hip to what was going on. He was following my sister around because he, you know, she was kind of shysty and <laughs> he knew she was up to something and he saw me. So they grabbed me up and uh, I got sentenced to two years in state prison. And I did that at Sussex One State Prison. I think I did 20 months on it or something, but got out, uh, was out about two months. Had 12 pending charges, three of them were felonies in three different cities, probation violations from, you know, from that. Did a few months, got out, the violation hit, did a few more months for that. I got back out and I went back to doing tower work. I got a, another job building towers and things were good. I, I did that for about a year and some change, but I had started back using heroin again and uh I didn't use real long I I got into methadone clinic so I would just go to the clinic every morning before work and the company was very accommodating and then we started seeing the copper theft show up and it gave me the idea of, hey this this is a good lick you know and they're out in the middle of nowhere I didn't think they would catch on to you know, because it, it, they wasn't even, police weren't even coming out to the job sites we were showing up at that had a piece or two of copper stolen. So I'm like, well, nobody even cared. And uh, they did care. <laughs> so I did that for a little while, and we had started using coke, uh, like speedball, and we'd go to the methadone clinic, but we were shooting up cocaine, you know. And uh, so life went to hell. I lost my house lost my job and that's when I started doing it like I, I started stealing like that full time you know it just fell fell in conjunction with me I got kicked out of the methadone clinic lost my job which of course immediately led to me losing my house and uh so I went for about 10 weeks we we went around stealing copper like it was a full-time job and let then the feds got for a minute though Keith you know, when you're out there getting high, man, were there ever times when you went to the city when you were down on your luck, no money, just there, lonely, like, damn, man, I need to get high. I'm dope sick. You ever find yourself in that position? Yeah, yeah, a lot. Um, you know, it's a, very, it's a very desperate feeling. You're always looking over your shoulder wondering how you're going to have money to keep that monster off of you day after tomorrow, you know, and uh, – it is, it's very uh, depressing and heartbreaking when you're there. But most of the time I didn't go without because I, I was uh, willing to commit crimes, you know, and I would, I would usually do it before then. So it would really only be the times that I got set down that I would really have a chance to think, you know, when you're in jail, then you're thinking, I've got to figure out how not to do this again. You know, when you're in active addiction, right, every day, your focus every day is, man, what am I going to steal tomorrow? You're thinking about tomorrow today, right? Like this, I mean, I you just see it where every day is a hustle. Every day is I got to get money somehow, some way, right? That's right. You can't relax. And it's, uh, it drives you, you know, and it doesn't matter. It doesn't play any favorite how you were raised, um, uh, what your career choice was like, like I said, I went to college for administration of justice. Um, and you know, at, at 18, 19 years old, I thought I was going to be a DEA agent. And, uh, that, 
totally went in the other direction, you know? And part of that was because of, like, I did armed security a little while and working with the, with law enforcement like that, I saw how, how messed up the justice system was and I didn't want to be a part of it, you know? So I, I went and did something else, but my point of that was like, I was raised in church with both parents there was no crime, you know, we could barely even see our neighbor's houses, you know, it doesn't matter. If, if you open the door to certain drugs, they, they'll put their hooks in you. And it's not really up to you where the ride ends, you know? You know, I went to that, I went to a Jelly Roll concert last night, man. He talked about, you know, that active addiction and, and, and you know, that lifestyle and, you know, how people can change and, you know, you can get out of it, man. It's not easy. It's a struggle, but you can get out of it. And eventually you get out of it. I mean, I know now you own a tattoo shop and, you know, you've been in some pretty dangerous prisons and we'll, we'll kind of go there now. Right. So you end up with what a 66 month sentence for stealing copper. Yep. That's correct. Never in your wildest dreams think that stealing copper would send you to a federal penitentiary. Right. <laughs> Never. And I mean, they, I got really blessed by the feds uh, indicting me because it was it was so much like Virginia would have crushed me because it was 17 jurisdictions, you know, um, with hundreds of felonies. And they they just put it in a 12 count indictment. So uh, I got spared. But, you know, I other than like the detainers and all that stuff, my, my crimes didn't warrant any kind of high high security, but I still started in a medium. You know, my lawyer was like, oh, you're going to a camp, you know, we're going to get you in the RDAP program. And uh, none of that that your lawyer tells you really matters. I mean, it might if you got millions of dollars, I can't say, but um, it sure as hell didn't help none in, in my case. And I, I don't even think that helps, man. I think when they want you, they want you. They don't care who your lawyer is or how much money you pay. How old are you when you get sentenced? Um, uh, 34, maybe something like that. Cause I was in, I was in jail a little while before I, I got sentenced. You're 34 years old on your way to federal prison. I mean, are you thinking, Hey, I'm going to an FCI. I mean, you don't know you're going to a USP, right? No, I didn't have a clue. And like I said, my, my attorney said that I, I may go to the low to start with, but that I'd probably be in a camp. Um, so I was, I was surprised when I went to a medium to start with. Um, and it, you know, it just, it escalated quickly. I wasn't there a year and had a management variable and I was in a pen. Tell the people why you leave the FCI, why you get that management variable and why they send you to the penitentiary. Well, uh, when I got there, I had been in, I had been in jail for 27 months. So, and was dealing with, like I said, all kinds of, of mental issues and trying different medications. And I had been in transit for about two months. So my, my medication regimen had gone to hell, you know, with changing from one facility to the next and then actually getting into BOP. So I was pretty crazy probably when I got there and very overwhelmed and uh, I was wild, you know, like there wasn't any metal detectors on the whole compound except going into Unicor. It was the only metal detector you ever went through. So immediately I thought everybody here has a bone crusher. Um, like, like I said, the only prison I'd ever been in was Sussex one state prison. And they, they sent me there just for reception but that's a level five penitentiary in Virginia, you know, like you're under the gun when you move and there's crazy violence. So that's my default is thinking that everybody here is strapped up. I don't know if Petersburg is Swedersburg. Uh, that's what they call it there. So I immediately made me a knife, like an ice pick, you know, with decent sized nail made into it, you know, with a toothbrush handle all slim so it was nothing to stop it you know the handle becomes part of the weapon and uh it didn't take real long before i got knocked off with it <laughs> i did about 70 days in the hole i think lost 41 days good time but then i got back out 
and uh, I did. I watched Pots and Pans in the kitchen, and there was a dude I was working with. He's cool DC cat. Did uh, he was one of the wine guys, and um, and you know we still had sugar then, and there was a uh, they sold V eight and fruit juice on the commissary. They they serve up. They have these big pans of sugar for breakfast. You know that we'd serve out, and of course we'd steal them. You know, so I'm I'm selling sugar. So I'm kind of buddies with with this dude J Rock that's making wine. And before Chow, he was he was in the bathroom right by our workstation by the deep sink, uh, bagging up bottles of wine that he would sell to people coming through getting Chow right. And he sold them for like half price if you if he didn't have to take them back to the unit. So the the cop comes through shook. And well, I just walked in the bathroom and only one of the lights in there worked. So I walk in, not knowing that he's in there even bottling up wine, and I see what he's doing, and I go to walk back out, and here comes Shook, the police doing his rounds. So I don't go out, you know, I don't want him to get knocked off. I just stand there and Shook shines his light in there. It's dark. He boom, and he shines it right in my face. So he comes in and tries to get it, and him and J-Rock start wrestling over the, the wine. He takes it and runs and dumps the whole bag of wine in the deep sink. Shook done hit the deuces and they come take us both to jail. And, uh, you know, the, the dude that was getting the wine, he told the, the people, you know, I didn't have nothing to do with it. I told them I didn't have nothing to do with it. And they were like, well, that's cool. We don't believe you. Uh, so they popped me for an alcohol shot and took another 27 days and put me on the hot list. So then I, uh, you know, I've started drinking some and I get popped. Hold on now, you got to tell the people what the hot list is because people that are listening don't know what the hot list is. I know what it is, but you tell them. Well, they, they call you for a breathalyzer. You got to be prepared for a breathalyzer at any time. And pretty much every day, I don't remember what time it was, like might have been seven o'clock, something like that. Uh, they would call a list of names over the over the PA system to come to the guard shack to take a breathalyzer. And uh, I went to pill line that night and I swung through somebody else's unit and got me two bottles of wine and went on back to my room. And I'm in there doing a tattoo. I left from uh, working on this kid's back to go to pill line. So I chugged one of the bottles. And then I'm just sipping on the other one and I'm back to tattooing and my celly comes, Hey, pick, they, they, uh, they called you for a breathalyzer. So I grab some, get a big mouthful of peanut butter, which of course doesn't help. And, uh, I put my tattoo machine and my ink in this pouch. I had a pouch in my sweatpants right there in the crotch where I would, that's where I kept my tattoo machine so they wouldn't find it. So I took it with me thinking I'm going through the hole, you know, and I'm going to try to take this with me. <laughs> and, uh, of course, the police laughed at me because they I had a mouthful of peanut butter. They're like, man, that shit don't work. You're hit. You know, so they took me over there, but they didn't watch me change. You know, they put you in that little room until you throw all your clothes out. So I just set my tattoo machine and my ink in the corner, threw my clothes out. And they came, had me do the whole turnaround and squat and all that crap and then gave me new clothes. So. I smuggled my machine and my ink into the shoe and uh, we went hog wild in there tattooing. Like I was just learning the kid that was in my room. He didn't know how to draw. He wanted to learn. Like we did a whole lot of this arm here in, in the hole then in Petersburg, but I blew a, uh, a 067 on the breathalyzer could have legally driven a car. And, uh, Miss Brown, my case manager came and she hated me. We were beefing the whole time I was there. Um, she said, you ever heard of Atwater, California? <laughs> and I'm like, uh, yeah, I've heard of it. And she said, well, if I got anything to say about it, that's where you're going. You ain't coming back on my compound. So now I'm kind of scared, you know, because everybody heard the pen stories, especially in a bitch ass yard. <laughs> like, excuse my language, like uh, Petersburg, you know, and I've done been there going on a year and, 
you know, people, I didn't really realize the full weight of it then, but people look at you kind of funny when you come from a yard like that and you land at the pen, you know? Um, and the guy I was in the cell with, he got designated for Pollock. And this was in, this was in 2010. So, you know, it was going down there and he, he was scared shitless. He was a white kid that was a vice lord. I covered up all this this vice lord stuff all on his stomach before he went to Pollock. He was trying to duck that, but I got designated to Lee and uh, and they sent me to USP Lee from there. So let me ask you this. You show up at USP Lee. I mean, you said you were already scared, nervous. You know, you find out, man, I'm going to a penitentiary. What's going through your mind, man, when you get there? What are you thinking? Like, damn. Well, um, they didn't they didn't let us onto the compound until after lockdown at night. And uh, that warden, I think, it just came there. He actually, it, it boom, my dog's trying to mess with me. Boom, Jack. So uh, he came and talked to us in, in R&D, you know, and gave us the rundown about, you know, we know stuff happens and y'all got to, y'all got to run a clean car. You can't have certain people here and that's fine. If, if there's some assaults, we'll get through it. Just don't use no weapons. I'd rather you didn't use no boots and stop when my officers get there. And uh, was, so it, was it O'Brien? I don't remember. But they they told me who my who my shot callers were. They were like, "Are you independent?" And I'm like, "I'm I'm just a regular dude." Because at uh at Petersburg it wasn't it wasn't racially segregated at all. There was a DMV car, and I was in that. And like most of the people I kicked it with there were black dudes. You know, like I'd already had some Paisa Sellies and black Sellies at Petersburg, so. When they start telling me all this stuff about the car at USB Lee and who my shot callers were, and I'm like, I'm my shot caller, huh? You know, and then, of course, they told me Ter Terry Arthur and Coon would, would be my, my shot caller, you know. So I'm already like. Hey, hold on, man. Let me stop you, right? Because I don't like Terry Arthur. Um, I think he gave the dude a knife to stab me. And I don't, I never liked Coon either. Um, so when you get there, you have to make a choice now, man. White car or black car, right? Pretty much. There was, you know, there was only a, a couple of, of Virginia dudes. The 083 number, Eastern District of Virginia, you know, it's, it's not real heavily represented by white dudes in there. You know, we there's a lot of cities here, and it's a whole lot of black guys doing time for, like, crack and stuff. You know, so most of my homies in there were not white dudes. Um, there was some people from the Western District of Virginia at at Lee, and uh, they ran with West Virginia, I think. But really, the whole white independent car was run by them Tennessee dudes, you know. Uh, so it was it was kind of weird, and they did have a a white mixed race car. It was like the the uh, it was mostly black guys, but it was a Virginia car. And they had just recently been kind of decimated. They had got into it with the Carolina black car not long before I got there. So it didn't look like a real, that one didn't seem to be a real promising route to take. <laughs> so, so you weren't there for that ride. I was there for that ride. And the kid stabbed the kid in the bottom court in his face. The Virginia kid stabbed the Carolina kid. And then it was full throttle out there. I remember you, man. Um, You probably weren't there long before. I ended up having my incident with Bledsoe and leaving, but I remember you. Um, so you're there. Now you make this choice, right? The, isn't it absurd that the, you know, the Federal Bureau of Prisons tells you who your boss is? Yeah, it was crazy. Now you go out on the yard, you make your choice, you're, you're in the white car. What's it like for you? I mean, what's that experience yeah. like? Sorry, I didn't hear you. My, my dog is being crazy. So you go out there on the yard, right? What's that experience like, man, that first day? I mean, you go there at night, but the next morning, you know, people are pressing you. Where are you from? I mean, what's it like? Tell the people that have never experienced that. Well, we locked down. Uh, I never even got out of my unit that morning. The Pisces went to work uh, before we even before we even got got out the chow. We came out, and, you know, of course, a couple of white dudes come hollered at me. 
there was a, a California dude, a, a older guy, kind of small dude. He had like silver hair. I don't remember his name. And an O-Town skinhead, both in my unit. I was in L unit. Um, and there was a scumbag uh, that was a dope fiend in there. I don't, you probably knew Kenny, Ken Delano. He was like, he was, he was notorious. Uh, but I mean, you know, I, I ended up kind of being buddies with him, but, but them dudes, they all came and talked to me, you know, asked me where I was from, what I was in there for. Of course, gave me the rundown about paperwork. Um, just, you need 30 days, to get, you know, you got 30 days to get your paperwork. But then when I got it, nobody even really cared. Nobody really much had much even looked at it there. It wasn't until I got to McCreary that things got more serious like that. But um like we were probably out that morning fifteen minutes and they started screaming lockdown because uh some of the Pisces in another unit had got one of the dudes that came in. So that was that was kind of like, well, I guess this is a different type of prison. <laughs> were you in the unit with Chevy, Keyhole? No. I think he was in like G or H. Eventually, like he ends up tattooing the back of your head, right? That's correct. And for those that don't know who Chevy is, I mean, they can always Google him. Pretty uh, wild case. I think it was him and his brother getting a shootout with the state troopers. They, um, you know, decimate a whole family, including kids, take their lives. And you know what? I think a lot of people didn't really realize what he was in there for because he might have been in danger. You know, had people known that he had taken out a couple kids, right? He, he would have been in danger, I think, um, and especially, like, I, when we talked on the phone, you know, I told you I watched a documentary. I watched a bunch of documentaries about him since coming home, and uh, there's there's some documentaries about Timothy McVeigh also, and if you watch those, they mention Chevy saying that there was a theory by the government that could never be proven that he 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 hit them people uh the the gun dealer and his family because they they had seen McVeigh and Nichols they ran they all ran in that same group that white power group in the Pacific Northwest allegedly you know that that's what they said on the documentary and I'm like man that's crazy cuz he was just you know Chevy kind of seemed like a nerdy dude to me you know a nerdy hillbilly right yeah Sometimes those dudes end up getting brainwashed and do wild things like he did. Um, but it is what it is. So you're in Lee County, man. How long do you stay in Lee County? USP Lee. Um, I left, I think about May. I got my, I got my head tattooed in the spring of 2011. So about May I left. So I was probably there nine months. Um, you end up leaving USP Lee. They started letting Serenios out and they needed they needed cells. So they put down this ruling, at least this is what I was told, that everybody that wasn't supposed to be there was getting shipped out. So that way they could have these cells. And my care level, I was care level one because of being on all the different medications and whatnot. Um, but I was also on a management variable. You know, I didn't I didn't have 10 points. They just they said I couldn't be adequately housed at a medium security place because I was acting like a fool. Um, so they they shipped me out and I I tried like hell. I don't remember who the case manager was, but. He seemed like a pretty reasonable guy, you know, and because I, I had been shot free, he's like, you're you're clearly doing well here. You're thriving. And he claimed to be working on my behalf to try to not get me shipped or maybe to get me shipped to Allenwood. And I was here in Allenwood was pretty sweet at the time. And they had, they had a uh, weight still. So, cause I didn't want to, I'm like, man, I ducked out on Atwater last time. They love to send me to the West coast and I'm not trying to be a part of that. Uh, but they ended up, they eventually did send me to McCreary. Um, and then they locked me in the hole, me and another guy, this dude, Mike Miller, he came from out west. They locked us both up for captain's review before they let us on the yard. His, because he had, 
he had stabbed somebody at uh, Victorville, and mine just because of my tattoos. They, you know, I've got I've got stuff here which I didn't know at the time, but I've got like the guard tower and the fence and the bars and all that. And, EWB? No, and but that's what they were looking at. They were like, you know, that's part of their patch, but. With theirs, I think it's supposed to be inside of the border of their state or whatnot. But anyway, with, between that and having this tattoo on my head, I was bald headed with a tattoo on my head. They just wanted to check me out um, to see why I got shipped from one pen to another for no apparent reason. You know, of course, then they eventually let me on the yard. Murphy had the yard there uh, at the time. And, you know, it was, it was crazy how smooth my, my walk through those places went, you know, it, it was like, I got really, really blessed that, that I went to, to the places I did when I did, you know, cause at both of those pins, the gangs had been smashed not too long before I got there. So it was like, it was relatively peaceful for the honkies, you know, it was a, there was a whole lot of just politics and cleaning your car type stuff at McQuarrie, you know, that was, even though Murph was from Carolina, it was a Missouri yard for the white dudes. And my Sally was a Missouri guy, so I just ran with Missouri there. And of them white Missouri kids are tough, man. I always say that. Them are some of the toughest white dudes i ever been around, or as you said, honkies, right? Yeah. <laughs> I'm just messing with you, man. But um, yeah. so while you're at McCrary, man, what's life like there? Um, It gave a new – a new definition to controlled movement. So pretty much, man, it was kind of like controlled over there at McCrary. I mean, not too much, you know, going on. I mean, there, there's some stuff going on at McCrary, but they kind of had control over there. At least the white dudes did as far as getting rid of the gang members and pretty much an independent car there at the time. Right. Yep. Yeah. It was a pretty much a Missouri yard for the, for the white dudes. And uh, they, they were quick to, to handle business, you know, um, sometimes they wouldn't even wait for confirmation. You know what I mean? They're like, well, you know how it is. It's like a popularity contest. Um, so if somebody says, Hey, I heard such and such, you know, I had, I think the dude's name was Bulldog. Uh, I heard he had a case in the state and, you know, if he was well liked, they'd investigate it before anything was done. But in the case that I'm talking about, that was it. Like that day, he he took a helicopter ride, you know, and then turned out later on that it was indeed true. He did have a, a prior case. But Let me ask like you this. That, you say he took a helicopter ride. Tell the people what happened to him, what they do to him. Uh, two dudes just, just ran up in the room on him and, and, and stomped him out real good. Like they, they weren't really using knives a whole lot there. Um. I think a lot of it had to do with with how how much the BOP was sending people to the smooth program for knives. They were, they had just kind of switched to smashing people. But anybody that got seriously hurt at McCreary, they they had to life flight out of there because it was so far to the hospital. It was like a, an hour ambulance ride or something. They said so. It was it was pretty regular that. We'd, we'd lock down, the helicopter would come in, you know. Uh, Let me ask you this. Does that affect you when you see somebody, you know, viciously beat like that where people are in there jumping on them and jumping on their heads and next thing you know they're out on a helicopter? Does that affect you mentally at all? Definitely. Um, and I didn't realize it really then. But, uh, like, I mean, I, I – Anytime I dream, and I try not to, but I, I dream about prison a lot still, you know, and I've been home just over nine years. Um, you know, it was kind of fun. It was kind of exciting when you get involved in, in you know how it is. People are bored and they're, they're looking for something to to keep themselves occupied. And people, people do that. Them dudes do that. Sad uh, so, reality, right, about that maximum security federal prison system where dudes are waiting for something to happen or, you know, it's exciting to go smash someone. Yo, I'm ready to go on. I'm doing that mission, bro. Like, they don't even care about the consequences of possibly getting, a you know, a life sentence if things don't work out, going to the hole for six months. You know, back in the day when we were there, 
I mean, Lee County would put you in the hole for a little bit, though. And, you know, I think McCrary would back then. You know, you might go to the hole in the beginning for two weeks for stab and so on because your partner says, oh, no, he wasn't involved. But then they started when they got the smooth program going, they started really kind of putting people back there. But dudes just sign up, don't they? Yeah, yeah. Dudes would, uh, but you'd be gone two or three days if you were one of the people that went on, went on the mission. But, you know, like they, I ain't gonna say they wouldn't let me, but when the time came to where, you know, it was like my turn, basically, the dude, Chris, that, that kind of had my unit was like, you're, you're not going, you know, that's crazy. Um, I had two or three years left, you know, they had already put me in for my good conduct transfer back to a, to a FCI. And, uh, he stepped in and was like, you know, we got, we got plenty of dudes here that ain't ever leaving the USP. Like you're not going. Um, and like I said, I, I wasn't like itching to go, but I wasn't put off by it either. Like I said, it was just going to be to stomp somebody, you know, it wasn't going to be to stab them. And I say just cause you know, that some of them images of people that's been stomped on real good. Don't ever go away. You know, when, when you see a human's head not look like a head no more, that's like a busted pumpkin or something. That's terrible. And uh, the smell that comes from that sort of stuff stays with you. You know, I see your face balling up right now. You know the smell I'm talking about. <laughs> not the life that uh, I think that's one of the motivating factors for me, man, was the violence that I've seen. I've been involved in some violence. You know, I think that's what really, man, was the deterrent factor for me, man. You know, of course, freedom feels great, and, you know, that's also a deterrent factor. But just the fact that you don't never want to experience that again, getting involved in, you know, hurting people or seeing that stuff. You know, I don't talk about a lot of that stuff, you know, my personal stories or whatever. But when you see that stuff and you experience it, man, I think it does change it. You think that was one of the – I mean, you've been out nine years. Is that something that always stays with you? I know you said you still dream about it, but – is that something that stays with you? Yeah. Uh, my art had a lot to do with, with me changing, I think. Uh, you know, I got a lot of validation from it. Like, I, it got me through doing time because that was all I did day in and day out. And that was that was the blessing of, of getting in trouble and going to a pen because where I was getting in trouble for it, you know, they kept taking my machine at Petersburg I didn't get no shots, but um, they didn't care in the pen. If you ain't stabbing people, they're like, whatever, man, go go do that. Just don't don't be uh, smashing people. So you're hustling, so, man. You're hustling in federal prison. You're tattooing, right? What did you charge people to do a whole sleeve back then? About 150 bucks. <laughs> charge people now on the street. You own your own shop. You're doing a whole sleeve. What are you charging them now? Uh, thirty five hundred. <laughs> so from one fifty to thirty five hundred, I mean, that's a hell of a difference. You ever have dudes in jail not want to pay you? You ever have issues? I remember the tattoo dudes. I had a celly that was a tattoo dude. Dude, they always went through some shit, man. Early on, um, later it it wasn't really that way. Like especially after I was at at Manchester, my last two years I did at Manchester. And, you know, I always had a waiting list. From the time I was at McCreary on, I was at least one of the best on the yard, if not, you know, the whole rest of my bit. So I was able to start charging a little more. I would charge people two books of stamps an hour, you know. Um, 250 was the starting price on a back piece. 150 was starting price on a sleeve. But normally it would be paid up front because I had a waiting list. At least a chunk of the money would be paid to me before they would even get on my schedule, you know. And uh, the only thing that would mess it up and cause me to have bad business would be when I would start using, you know. So one of the dudes I knew would get some tar in or something, and and then I, all my money would be gone, and I'd have a whole bunch of credit. I done, and now I'm in the hole. I got a tattoo for free for the next month basically to pay for doing heroin for four days straight, you know. Do you know what, Keith, you're free now, man. It seems like you've conquered that addiction. You're off the psych meds. You've been out for nine years. 
You know, tell the people about your tattoo shop. What's the name of that tattoo shop that you got, and where can they find you? It's a uh, Primal Tattoo in Carrollton, Virginia, and uh, our website is tattooprimal.com. Um, primal underscore tattoo on Instagram. My Instagram is pick taps with pick underscore taps. Um, let me see. I guess that's about it. I did my first tattoo convention last year. Did another one this year. That was that was something on the bucket list. I ain't won no awards yet. That's also on on the list. We'll see how that goes. I mean, you're free. You, you're making a good living. You're off drugs. I mean, that's what's up. Before we get ready to go, man, anything? I know you tune into the channel. I think you and your wife watch it. Anything you want to say before we go? Um, just. Well, to you, you know, keep doing what you're doing. You know, you know, I, I know you you have your own struggles sometimes, man, and you're you're doing a good thing. You, you know, what we do has ripples that we don't we don't always see. A lot of times, we don't see the reverberations going out from what we're putting out in the universe. And you're doing a lot of good, you know. So keep doing that. But you know, to anybody else. Just think about what you're doing. Like you always say, you know, what is your life worth? Because when you're in there, you know, like even if you're really, really getting money and you go do even a small sentence, you go do 10 years, was that worth it? Like if you had a million dollars, you now you do 10 years, you break that down to $100,000 a year that you don't get to keep because they take all that. But even if you got to keep it, like that's a hundred thousand dollars ain't ain't what it used to be, man. And uh, imagine going through that hell you went through for a hundred grand a year. Uh, and a lot of people ain't getting that kind of money, you know. Like it just ain't worth it. To the the game is rigged. Nobody retires. There's no successful ending to to criminal life. It's I mean, you maybe you get to prison somewhere and you get to have the keys to the yard before some other person comes and takes them. Um, but like, that's not a retirement plan, and it doesn't matter what your crime is. Like, you don't get to choose what they do with you once you get in there. You know, when you get on that prison bus, it it might take you to one of them bad spots, and it doesn't matter if if your criminal history says that's where you belong. That's the type of criminals you're supposed to be around. You know, I'm, I'm case in point, man. They can send you wherever they want to send you. And and you just either have to adapt or get eaten up. That's what it is, right? Keith, it's adapt or get eaten up. I think today's message is, again, man, I think it's another day where you have to go look in the mirror. Go look in the mirror and ask yourself what your life's worth. And, you know, you're, you're the deciding person. You decide what it's really worth. You decide where you drive your car. But listen, man, I appreciate you coming on, sharing your story, sharing your experiences. We'll put up your links, man, so people can check you out. I checked out your work. It's really good. We'll put some pictures up in the videos, but definitely appreciate you coming on, man. And I wish you all the best and all the success. Tell people if they like what we're doing, hit that like button, subscribe, Blood on the Razor Wire TV. You already know what it is. Until tomorrow, with respect, we're out. Thank <laughs> you.